The movement for equality in Oregon goes back over three decades, and there are so many people who spoke out at a time when you know, being open and honest about your life could land you in jail. The 1970s was a very primitive time for civil rights in a sense. So you can imagine what an uphill battle it was to start talking about equal rights for gays and lesbians when Oregon didn't even yet recognize equal rights for women under its constitution. My colleague Jerry Webb had gotten a call from the ACLU asking if he was would be willing to represent uh, a lesbian school teacher down in Turner, Oregon, a little town just south of Salem, who had been fired when the principal of her school found out that she was a lesbian. The great and admirable thing about Peggy Burton is that she just didn't sneak off into the sunset. She was willing to make a stand. She was willing to let her name be used. She was willing to go to court and say, yes, I am a lesbian. I am a good school teacher. I want my job back. That was a great victory because we'd never had any victories up until then in Oregon. Right to Privacy was a successor organization to the Portland Town Council and it became sort of the political arm of, of the community, working to elect candidates to office and then lobbying the legislature for equal rights. The political landscape for elections in the 1990s was still really difficult. The House took a giant step to the right, and at the same time, we had our first openly gay elected House member, Gail Shibley, and by 1995, there would be three openly gay members, George Amy, a Democrat, and uh, Chuck Carpenter, a Republican, in addition to Gail. And they certainly paved the way for me. In 1992, the Oregon Citizens Alliance put on the ballot the most vicious anti-gay and lesbian ballot measure that has ever existed in the United States. It was the first anti-gay initiative that had appeared on the ballot in any state. The first ballot measure nine, I think, really galvanized the community in a way that hadn't happened before. It felt like we were fighting for life and death. It was so horrific in its implications that people woke up and got a clue. It was not just noticed on the local level, it was noticed internationally. Not only did we have really great local talent here running that campaign, but the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, the Arkansas Women's Project, the Human Rights Campaign, all sent in some of their best staff to help direct the effort. And I think that, that helped ensure victory in the end. And I think it helped teach a whole new vanguard of future leaders for the community. It was an incredibly intense time, an incredibly scary time. In spite of all that, we won. And the OCA came back right away and started doing local measures in about, a, I want to say about a dozen communities all around the state. These local ballot measures were like a death by a thousand cuts. As we came into 1994, we knew what we were going to be facing. We were going to be facing that kinder, gentler, and I use that totally in quotes, language to try to get discrimination into the Constitution. And we really made sure that we connected the history of, of Measure 9 with 13. Coming out of our victories in the mid-90s, we came to the realization as a community that we couldn't let our activist work just stop and start based on ballot measures, that we really needed an ongoing organization. And that's really how Basic Rights Oregon was born. As the organization was emerging in the late 90s, there were critical issues at play in the courts, um, the legislature, and in electoral politics. The importance of the Tanner decision is that it was the first court decision to recognize that the state of Oregon, when in any of its actions, needs to look at those actions and assess whether they are treating gay people and gay couples in the same way that they're treating every other Oregonian. The Oregon legislature had a bill to place a Defense of Marriage Act on the 2000 ballot and they voted and it went down 1613. At that time, these DOMA bills and constitutional amendments were passing left and right across this country. In 2000, Basic Rights Oregon successfully defeated the second Measure 9. We had won the campaign, but we didn't have much power. And we were at a place where we really needed to um, harness some energy and make the organization grow. It was both invigorating and demoralizing at the same time and what became clear was we had to be working on 
all fronts at all times. We knew that we needed to build an organization that was a powerhouse politically, but also in terms of being a stable, solid organization that was credible, that people wanted to be a part of, that was exciting and doing great things. The challenge ahead of us was to figure out how do we bring everyone together, what should we be doing, and how can we turn things around and stop being on the defensive. <laughs>